In this video, I want to explain why, even if we assume that for each individual in our system, that the Gauss-Markov conditions of no autocorrelation and no heteroscedasticity, even in those circumstances, when we consider the system as a whole, there is a variance-covariance matrix which isn't diagonal. In other words, there is autocorrelation and there is heteroscedasticity. So at the end of the last video, we found this expression for the variance of our overall system error, given that we have our matrix of independent variables x, and we wrote it in the sort of longer form over to the right here. And if we continue to work with this, we can say that this is equivalent with the expectation. Now, if we work out the individual components, the first component is just going to be the error epsilon 1 times epsilon 1 primed. So that's just going to be epsilon 1 times epsilon 1 primed. The second component is going to be epsilon 1 times epsilon 2 primed. So that's just going to be epsilon 1, epsilon 2 primed. And then if we go all the way over to the right in the first row, that's going to be epsilon 1 times epsilon n primed. So that's just going to be epsilon 1, epsilon n primed. And then if we move down to the next row, if we had a sort of epsilon 2 here, we'd have epsilon 2 times epsilon 1 primed. The second component would just be epsilon 2 times epsilon 2 primed. And then if we were to fill out the rest of the matrix in a similar way, we'd find that the last component was epsilon n times epsilon n primed. And we're taking all of this given that we have our matrix of our independent variables x. So that's what the matrix or the variance covariance matrix of our system looks like overall. And this is quite striking because even though we assumed that for each individual there was no heteroscedasticity and there was no serial correlation, that's evident here because we've assumed that for each individual they have a sort of constant times the identity matrix as their variance covariance matrix. So that's basically stated mathematically the fact that there's no heteroscedasticity and there's no autocorrelation. But what we have assumed is we've assumed that between individuals, contemporaneously at least, there is a degree of serial correlation. And that's what this term up here represents. And we've assumed that this correlation between different individuals at the same time actually is represented by some non-zero value. And because of that, that allows us actually to write this variance covariance matrix for our system in a particularly simple form. But before we do that, we should note that because of this non-zero value of the correlation between the error of an individual i and the error of an individual j, these off-diagonal elements, so that, that's this element, this element, etc., all the off-diagonal elements aren't necessarily going to be equal to zero. So that's going to be suggestive of the fact that there is autocorrelation. And similarly, these diagonal components, they're not necessarily constrained to have the same variance because even though I've assumed for each individual there is a amount of variance which is given by sigma i squared, I haven't necessarily assumed that it was just sigma squared. So sigma i squared means that it can vary between different individuals. So our matrix doesn't satisfy, for the system at least, the conditions of no autocorrelation and homoscedastic errors. And that will become even more evident as we sort of expand this out a bit further. So the first component is this sort of epsilon 1 times epsilon 1 primed. And we're assuming that that's just equal to the variance, which is sort of sigma 1 squared times the matrix IT. And actually, I'm going to simplify this a bit by assuming that sort of sigma I squared is equivalent to omega I, I just so that these two notations this one and this one actually match up. So the first component is just going to be omega 1, 1 times the identity matrix, it. Because that's really just the variance covariance matrix for individual 1, right? But then if we consider the second element in the first row, this is then going to be given by omega 1, 2 times the identity matrix. And it's going to be given by omega 1, 2 because I've assumed that between individual 1 and individual 2, there exists a non-zero covariance or contemporaneous covariance which is given by omega 1 2 and I need to multiply it by the identity matrix with of dimensions t by t because I've assumed that this serial correlation is only contemporaneous if it wasn't contemporaneous then I couldn't use the identity matrix here I'd have to use 
a more general matrix. But because I've assumed that only contemporaneously, that means we can use the identity matrix. And then if I go all the way to the right and I look at the last component, that's obviously just going to be omega 1n times the identity matrix it. And then if I move to the next row, I'm going to have omega 2 1 times the identity matrix it. The next component, the diagonal component, is just going to be well sigma 2 squared, which is the same as omega 2 2 times it. And then we can sort of fill out the rest of the matrix in a similar fashion. So the bottom row would actually have omega n1 times it, and then the last component of the bottom row would be omega n n times the identity matrix it. And so when we see when we write it this form that the matrix obviously isn't diagonal. So we've got serial correlation and we've got heteroscedasticity because of the fact that these diagonal elements aren't necessarily the same. And because of our knowledge of the Kronecker delta product, we can actually write this in a much neater form, which is it's equal to a matrix omega, which I'm going to define in a minute, um, taken with the cross, oh sorry, the Kronecker delta product of that matrix omega with the identity matrix it. And the matrix omega here is obviously just going to be our matrix of omega 1 1 through to omega 1 n, then omega n 1 through to omega n n. So remember what the Kronecker delta product is, essentially what it does is it takes every element of the matrix omega and it multiplies that scalar by the second matrix, which in this case is the identity matrix, which is t by t. So this thing is going to be nt by nt in dimensions. So because of the fact that this matrix is not diagonal, that should tell us something. It should tell us that if we are looking at the system as a whole, we shouldn't be using OLS. Because if we use OLS, we know it's not the best linear unbiased estimator. What we should be using is GLS, because GLS for the system as a whole is a way of correcting for the presence of the serial correlation and heteroscedasticity. And if we use GLS on our system, it's going to produce more efficient estimates of the parameters than we would have achieved through OLS. But that's quite a striking thing, really. Remember that the initial assumption was that for each individual, the Gauss-Markov assumptions are upheld. But what this says is, is that if there is some sort of information which is left in the errors for or between different individuals, then essentially that is some information which we could use to make our estimates a little bit better. And that's why using GLS on the system is better than just doing OLS on each individual equation.